Reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 1, verse 8, through chapter 2, verse 10. Now a new king arose over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase, and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithon and Ramses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Push, Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him, but if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, and they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwife said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every boy that is born in the Hebrews, you should throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the home of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, and she saw the child, he was crying, and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse him, the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So she went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him to her as her son. She named him Moses, because, she said, 
and drew him out of the water. Power, profit, and principle. Power, profit, and principle. If there was a pill that could give five minutes of pure power, would you take it? The Netflix number one watch movie this past week, Project Power, is based on a pill that has been made that gives people power. They give it to a few people to push on the streets for free. Word of mouth travels on the street. And soon enough, people are scrambling on the streets, willing to harm others so that they can have five minutes of power. The problem for those hooked is after five minutes, they no longer have power. The power only lasts five minutes, just five minutes to have unlimited power. In the text today, in the biblical text that you just heard read, there is a figure that had great power. power. His title is Pharaoh. Like presidents changed, so did Pharaoh. Pharaoh was the son of the sun god Ra. Like presidents, each pharaoh had a different personality and a different set of skills, a different way that they executed, a different way that they managed. Very early on, we are made to know that this new pharaoh did not like the Israelites. It wasn't that he did not remember them, but he did not seem to remember all that Joseph had done to save the, is the Egyptians during the famine and during tough times. That seemed to be lost on him, or at least an appreciation of that was lost on him. Joseph and his brothers, as we learned on last week, had reconciled. They had now buried their father. They had been living together a while now peacefully. Joseph and his family had grown, and while the text would lead us to believe that they were bigger than the Egyptians. Actually, biblical scholars will say that even though they were significantly bigger, still there were more and more Egyptians. I think the text is just trying to emphasize that they had really grown. They were living and growing and providing a profit to this economy. But this was not good enough for this Pharaoh, and so he began to spin a false narrative on the Israelites. When you create an enemy, Within, it's easy for people to follow. When we are divided by false narratives, it's easy to put everyday people against one another. And so this new Pharaoh, with his power, began to make life hard for the Israelites. And we see repeated oppression, ruthless treatment, forced labor, and imposed tasks on the Israelites, all because someone decided, for one reason or another, they did not like them. And in verse 14, we are told that the Egyptians made the Israelites' lives bitter with hard service. This powerful Pharaoh willingly and intentionally targeted one group of people because he did not like them. But this did not have the desired effect that this Pharaoh wanted. And the Israelites continue to grow. They continue to produce. And they continue to bring profit to the Egyptians. And so this upsets Pharaoh more and more. And he goes even further. He goes to the midwives and instructs them to kill every baby boy that the Israelite mothers deliver. You can hate people all day, but when you have power, when you have power, you can build systems and construct walls and keep folks down for centuries. This is what it means to oppress people. In addition to cutting off the next generation, in addition to using labor for their profit, now this pharaoh was asking the midwives to kill the babies. We have another example of what it looks like to oppress people back in the early 70s. It was called the War on Drugs. It had been long suggested that drugs were specifically planted in certain communities to weaken them, to deliver them without power. In the early 70s, on trial, an administrator, John E., said these words. The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that, had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. 
You understand what I'm saying? We know we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black. But by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. In our governments across the world, often power has been used systemically to oppress others, all the way to the point where we create false narratives and tell lies, keeping certain groups of people down and confined and powerless. In the Israelite story, Pharaoh is oppressive. He is oppressive. But in every generation, there are people that are raised up. Here are the midwives being told by a very, very powerful man that they are to kill all the male babies. When Pharaoh speaks to you, you do exactly what Pharaoh asks. You don't ask a lot of questions. You do what you are told to do. Here was someone in leadership over the people telling them to do something that they knew in their heart was wrong to kill babies and take them out. Here was someone above them looking down on them, speaking to them, instructing them to kill babies. You want to stop a community and a group of people from growing and living, kill their male babies. What were the midwives to do? They didn't have the pill power back then to take so that they could have five minutes of power. A couple of decades ago, a civil war had been raging for years between the dictatorship of the Liberian government and the rebels who were called the Lurds. The Lurds wanted to overthrow this dictatorship government. They terrorized the people in the country through killings and rapes and dismemberment and destruction. They were becoming more powerful as they closed in on the capital. One unlikely heroine is inspired by a dream to bring Christian women together to start a peace moment that consists of praying. She begins with her own church and she asks all the women from her church and she brings them together at one meeting. And she continues to do this. And then at another meeting, a Muslim woman shows up and says, I like what you all are doing. You need to include the Muslim women in this peace movement. This was a cause that you sended all differences. With this extraordinary mission, the women dressed in plain white. They covered their heads because they wanted to shed any differences between class and religion among them. These women knew that they had to rise up. They decided to make peace signs and sit at the fish market where the dictator president would drive by each day. The government continued to ignore them. The women knew that they couldn't just hand things up, but they continued to be present. And finally, they were allowed to have a conversation. They had this conversation. The peace talks finally came to fruition, and a delegation of them goes to Ghana to ensure that a resolution is made. The first two weeks, there's no progress. People are talking, and there's no progress that can be made around the table. The rebel warlords are just demanding future positions in the government and access to the country's resources. The Liberian president had already fled back to Liberia when Sierra Leone tries to indict him for war crimes. The women continue to grow angry, and they continue to pray, and they continue to stage a sit-in. They block all the doors and windows, preventing anyone from leaving the peace talk without a resolution. Trapped with no food and water, the talks continue. The talks begin to become serious. Finally, a resolution is signed. The UN peacekeepers move in, and the Liberian president is exiled to Nigeria. The woman understood that they could not rely on anyone else to make sure that the resolutions are implemented. They also realized seeing the UN only creating chaos that to ensure full disarmament in their country, they would need to step up. 
They would need to forgive their perpetrators. We talked about forgiveness on last Sunday and convince each one of them that they would be accepted back into their community. The truly final mission for the women was to ensure a democratic election. And in that election, interestingly enough, they got a female, their first female president. The women finally can go home. The mission accomplished. Peace comes to Liberia. But the women had to rise up. The women had to rise up. Likewise, in the text today, the midwives have to rise up. No, he didn't just say what he said. The text says that these midwives feared God. In other words, they cared about what was important to God. What mattered to God mattered to them. We did not get into this line of work. We did not become midwives in order that we might kill babies. They are trained to help babies enter the world safely. But their own lives are now at threat because Pharaoh has instructed these orders. So what should they say? And so when Pharaoh returns for a report on the killing of the babies, they concoct a lie. They say, you know, those Israelite women, they are not like the Egyptian women. Men, they popped them babies out so quick. Before we could get there, they were gone. We're sorry. We just couldn't do it. They were gone. Sorry, Pharaoh, nothing happening. No baby killing on our watch. No disrespect for life on our watch from beginning to end. No false narratives on our watch. The midwives know this ain't God. God raises them up. Pharaoh has gone too far. The women must resist. They must stand. Principles are important. Principles are important for us. They guide us. They raise us up. They say when to go and when we should stop and when maybe we should pause. And when others are doing things in our world and in our community or even in our very own families, our principles guide our actions. Life is important from the beginning through all the stages, not just in the womb. Life is important at all stages. And so we have to participate in policies and just acts that support the whole living of all of creation. The praying women of Liberia got it. The midwives got it. They remind us that sometimes you have to stand up to power and resist evil that is happening all around you. Our world is in deep trouble. And it is not our power that is needed. It is our principles. They are the way. So today I began with a movie on Netflix called Project Power. I asked if you could take a pill and have any superpower for five minutes, would you take it? Would you take it? The main character in this film, played by Jamie Foxx, decides he would not take the pill. He decides after looking at people that take the pill that he doesn't want that kind of power. He realizes that that kind of power does something destructive to the people who take it. Too much power ended up corrupting them and destroying them. They became greedy. They wanted more. They wanted more five-minute powers. They became addicted to power. Does this movie seem far out? Not really. Too much power often leads to abuse of power. Power entices many of us. Often, it does not bring out the best in us. Man, do you ever see that man that's been given power to direct traffic? I mean, it's like that power has gone to his head. Sometimes too much power is not good for us. But we see this movie and we see this commitment of the main character to humans. We see his commitment to the life-giving power. We see his commitment to his principles that he tries to get back his daughter. He doesn't want power, but he's guided by his principles. And we see it in the character and we see it in the praying women in Liberia and we see it with the midnight. We see this where people are guided not by power, 
but by their principles, by what it is we believe. This being led by our principles that gives us a different kind of power, a power that we can manage, a power that makes a difference in our world. This past Thursday, Joe Biden, in his acceptance speech at the DNC, quoted Ella Baker, if you give people the light, they will find their way. I believe if you give people their principles, they will find their way. With our principles, with our B-I-B-L-E, <laughs> with what we believe in, we will find our way. It's not about power and it's not about profit, but it's about our principles. Let us as the body of Christ, as believers, as followers, continue to follow our principles and let our principles lead the way. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we are living in times that are very, very different, very trying. There are days where we can clearly see our blessings, and then there are days where we just don't know. There are days when we have question marks. There are days when we grow tired and weary. There are days when we get the news that somebody has lost this battle. There are days when we find out that people we love are no longer on this side. Lord, we are living in strange times. What would you say to your people? Lord, help us to remember our principles, to remember our rootedness, to remember that we are not alone. I pray that you encourage your people, that they know that they are not alone, that we really are united, and that our principles give us a power in this world. Be with your people, in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>